ho, he ha, ha ha ha, he ha ho. Sometimes you start with the wrong syllable, and then you have to make up a new way to introduce great on TV. What's up, all you party people? It's Justin. It's Jerry. Damn it! Fuck! 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 <laughs> God damn it! Fuck! That would have been so good. Hey, Justin, it how you doing, been, man? <laughs> it would have been so good. Instead, it wasn't. No. You know, and that's a lesson. A lesson that you can take with you. Just. Make sure you don't forget that lesson the <laughs> rest of your life. Just uh, whenever you think about, maybe even when you've done something good, just think, oh, but I did but that, that one, one bad time. Thing one I time. fucked up and said the wrong syllable at the beginning of that Tuesday night. Treasure it. Treasure it in your heart. Uh, Brian, tell you what, a lot going on here at, uh, at, at the old homestead. We're doing podcasts. We're, we're uh, gambling my financial future. We have a baby. It's drinking a lot of milk and uh, uh, just, it makes a new noise, Brian. Can I give you my impression of the new noise that the baby makes? Uh, yeah, yes, but first, everybody go to your sub stack. We'll get to that. Okay, all right, uh, all right. Uh, here's the new noise that the baby makes. Ooh. <laughs> uh, now, what, what is the stimulus that engenders this, this response? No one knows. No one knows. It could be a stiff breeze. It could be that she's already pooped. It could be that she's hungry. Every once in a while, though, now, just just mixing it into the repertoire is... <laughs> uh, can you spell it for us? Here, we'll, we'll do a little... There you go. I want you to spell it, Justin. Oh, that's a... Uh, uh, o, capital O, lowercase O. Capital O, capital O, capital O, lowercase O, lowercase O, lowercase O. That means you win. Uh, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, we have a cavalcade of stars joined by one of our favorite beings in this entire universe. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the dapper one themselves. That's right. Wallace. Wallace is joining us. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> also accompanied by a seeing eye human, one Andrew Heaton. How are you, Andrew? Hello. Good to be back. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, 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 how many months has it been since 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 you since vanished? I've, since I've been here. Well, I left for Chicago and thence to Scotland in Ju July, late July. No, in August. July. In August. Was it uh, August? Yes, it was August. It was, yeah, August, it was August because uh, it was it was close to my daughter being born. That's yeah. right. Yeah, but I but I think it's been a long time since I've been on the program proper. I, I I think this is maybe May when I was last on here. It was the the epic time we almost bought the Jar Jar Binks uh, uh, statue. Whenever that was. Oh my God! Yeah, and since then, uh, I guess you didn't know that we've started the world's finest museum of Jar Jar inspired uh, it, art. Wait, hold on. Is it this of thing? Jar Jar? Because th this is, I, I came in and I was like, this looks like a really tiny shrine to Jar Jar Binks. Like if Jar Jar Binks had become a god in some country I've never heard of, it would it would look like this in, in various places. It's phenomenal. I love it. Uh, yeah, well, it, indeed, uh, it did come to pass. Uh, I'm trying to remember what other jart we have. Nathan, what other jart do we have that's not there? Um, doo -doo 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 -doo, that we That's not there currently? Yeah, um, I, I guess that's all of it. I think that's all of it currently. If anything's at the P.O. boxes, they're there, but that is our current collection. All right, right on. Uh, uh, plugs, plugs, uh, uh, plug, uh, coming up this week, we've got books, books on books on books, and a sub stack. Uh, uh, no, 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 you know, let, let's focus on, on uh, Heaton. You've been working on this book for a really long time, so uh, 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 tell us about it. I've got a book out. It's called... Tribalism is dumb. I worked. The, the title took me a while to come up with. Not as long as the book, though. I've been working on this for about seven years, actually. So it's me trying to come up with a unified field theory of why everybody went crazy when it comes to politics this last decade. Why everybody become a dick? Why we got to be so mean? Where's that coming from? That's what I wrote a book about. Tribalism is dumb. I do a bunch of evolutionary research. I read a surprising amount of sociological studies. And then I added a layer of jokes on it so that you would find it more enjoyable than all of the research I did. 
So this is now out, and I would love it if people bought the book. You can get it on Amazon. I have it in Kindle format, paperback format, Audible. All right, um, right. hold on, hold on, hold on. We got to uh, drop everything. Hand, all hands yeah. on deck operation. Please be, there, please be 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 there. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Did you do the thing where you forgot to make sure the thing was on, and then you made an appearance to promote the thing? I'm, I might have. It seems like it's there. Multiple people have told me they've bought it, but I don't trust them. I don't trust them. <laughs> Maybe that's, that's how done. you know your friends oh, yeah, and not I love friends. That. I love that, uh, that art. That Thank cover you. art's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, if you can't quite tell people, it's. Uh, oh, look at this! I just typed in the word tribalism only. You're number one in tribalism. I'm number one in tribalism. Yes. Oh, look yes. at that! You got an audible audiobook. And the goal is the goal is for you, the reader or the listener, if you want to get into an audible, to just be able to understand things a little bit better of why people went nuts. Just be a little bit less baffled and a little bit less confused, and hopefully that'll make your life easier as you deal with all of the nonsensical, awful politics that's happening these days. Uh, hey. what's, the, what's, what's, what's the biggest thing that you, that you learned while writing it? You know, the, 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 the biggest thing I think that I, I took as a takeaway um, that's foundational to the book is I don't think people are in a neutral state and then they find an enemy tribe and they go, oh, I hate that tribe. I, I think that we are proactively looking to be on a team and we are proactively looking to fight another team. And that can be healthy, like in, in organized sports. I, for one, love football. And it's a good way to get those teamsy instincts in a, in a good pro-social manner. I'm, gl uh, I'm glad you brought this up because we were talking about what do we think Heaton's favorite team is this year mm -hmm. and, and whether mm -hmm. or not he thinks uh, – uh, which conference he thinks they're going to make it all the way to the Super Bowl. Yes, Will. My favorite team is, of course, the Dallas Cowboys. And <laughs> I uh, – they are, as we know, in the 10th Circuit – they're in the tenth uh, circuit. Okay. Uh, yeah. How do, how are they going to do that team from uh, uh, soon to be your home, Washington D.C. Right. Like, well, I, I tell you, Bri I, Brian I, Brushwood I, and Andrew Heaton having a discussion <laughs> about sports is like two gold star lesbians <laughs> talking about deep throating. <laughs> So yeah, Brian. My, I assume that NFL districts just share the same the same districts as the Supreme Court and appellate courts. <laughs> that, like that, I assume that, appellate courts are the same as the conferences, right? They, so far, that tracks. That tracks. Yeah. So the Tenth Circuit would be Oklahoma West, and yeah, includes Texas, I think. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I think the Cowboys will do real well. I think they're. They, he, you know do what? you think they've they got they a hell of a quarterback this, this year? Do, do you think that they should abolish the Super Bowl in favor of the popular vote? <laughs> Uh, the, the Super Bowl is sacred, Justin. The Super my whole <laughs> my whole year revolves around the Super Bowl. So if they were to they were to try to get rid of that, would we even be America? I don't think so. Would we? Yeah. Would we? Would we? Uh, 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 the Buck in our chat room says, uh, uh, "Please make Heaton talk about the the Jets." You will hear him talk about the Jets tomorrow on Wearing Out Wrong for money. It's our Patreon episode. I'm mm -hmm. going to make uh, Andrew Heaton talk about an NFL coach who was fired and two international controversies that have spun up from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it was funny. It for, for real, the first time I was ever on camera commenting on anything was in high school. We had a very rudimentary, like, streaming online pre-YouTube thing for the football team. And they asked me to be the color commentator on the football games. So there was an actual, really? there was an actual guy who knew football. My friend Ryan McGee, who's who's a, a very much a sports student and would, uh, I probably does stuff on the side now, but w would have been a great, great, great sports broadcaster if he'd gone that route. And they had me do color commentary. I don't think I've in any way advanced in my knowledge of sports since that time. I think that was that that what the level of knowledge I had at, at seventeen is about where I am right now. But far more knowledge. On tribalism as a sociological concept and how it makes elections bad, which is why you should buy my book, Tribalism is Dumb. Uh, hey, word to the wise. Uh, one, Here's a fun thing that I like to do when my friends have books. Now, I'm not telling anybody to do this because it might be it might come back to bite us in the butt since we're live on a stream. But I'm, I'm going to tell you guys a thing that I like to do is if a friend of mine is putting a book out and I know I'm already going to love the book or maybe I've read a passage and I already have an opinion, I personally make sure to fill out a review but most importantly, I make sure to take a photo of myself having a good time reading the book or put a relevant photo, uh, maybe even an AI generated one, because it seems like reviews with photos really help and show up for a long time.
Nice. I like that. Uh, uh, sorry, I was filling out my five-star review for Tribalism is Dumb. Thanks, Didn't Justin. you write a book with a similar title about communism? I've, I've got three or four that have the word is in them. This is the last time I'm going to have the... I, I have communism... No, laughter's better than communism. And okay. I have another book called Los Angeles is Hideous. Now, Los Angeles okay. is Hideous, that one got to number one on poetry on Amazon. So I, I am yeah. technically a more proficient poet than I am comedian or lover at this point in my life, which <laughs> is fine. But I'm hoping this book, this book will also make me funny group expert guy or something like that. But yeah, next time I won't have the word is in the title that way. I'm, oh, uh, no, no, no. I, I, look, you got it. You got a thing great. now. Like blank is blank. All your books should be that. Communist, yeah. It, 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 to be honest, yeah, That just go for that. Okay. All right. I'll do that then. Yeah. Although I'm I not going to write you retitle like your first book, uh, 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 Communism is Shit. <laughs> like they make it just it's always like two different things but yeah. is this in the middle yeah, right yeah, uh, maybe yeah. unfunny uh communism is unfunny well i mean i already have laughter is better than communism i don't feel yeah like but, I but, to... but i mean you could just take that book and burn all the copies and start all over again maybe even rewrite the book and just have it only say variations of communism is unfunny yeah, shouldn't i be at the point in my career where i can just kind of like re-microwave all the stuff i've already done that would be great i keep trying to automate myself with ai and so far no but one of these days <laughs> so, pretty sure there'll be a button that just says make heat and ai boop and i'll hit that <laughs> it'll crank out books there was a so uh, God, that's dangerously close to a real thing that I'm doing now because uh, uh, about uh, 250, 300 episodes into Scam School, we started to do before uh, we called it Scam School Remix, like take a 15 minute episodes, edit out the commercials, get it down to three to five minutes. And on the 500th episode that we posted on the channel, uh, I, I would always end with a funny thing and then uh, walk off screen. And in this case, I said, uh, man, I wonder what it'll look like 500 episodes from now, uh, which is right around the number we're at now. He's like, maybe we should do Scam School Remix Remix. It'll just be even more cut down. And I saw this because I was making shorts all week. One minute ah. remixes <laughs> of the content that I did before. But the, uh, the classics don't change, though. He, Just like he the, the Dallas Cowboys himself. and the Jets, two fine American sports teams. Uh, how long have you been working on this book, Keats? About, about I know it's been a, it's been a six, minute. Seven or eight years is when I started working on it. God I, damn! I, I, st I started working on this right when I moved to Austin the first time. Well, which and, was in and 2018. To put it in perspective, the very first time that Heaton and I had lunch, he mentioned this book that he was working on. Yeah. Well, like, you know, so um, I, I was kind of freaked out back in 2017. Uh, I, I was living in New York City. Uh, Trump had just won. And it was this weird thing. Where what? I, <laughs> it was a big deal in New York City. But it was also a big deal for me, not just because of Trump, but because all the social relationships changed in a way that really surprised me. Because uh, I, had, I, I had been in New York City and I was working for Fox Business, but my social life was entirely in the comedy community. And so when I'd meet people and they'd go, where do you work? I'd go, Fox Business. I love gay people. <laughs> and immigrants and, and and everybody was fine they were like that's fine that's fine so it's just like a tax thing and you're like basically it's a tax thing yes i like i we we have all the same tolerances i just don't think the government works as well as you do that's pretty much it everybody was fine with it and then when when trump won i i found that there was this this weird calcifying galvanization thing that happened where a lot of people just got really angry and i i slowly realized that it was a, a lot of people what they considered acceptable really had nothing to do with me. It was just sort of how scared they were and the, the zone would increase or decrease. But it was kind of socially traumatic, to be honest with you. And so a lot of this was sparked by me going, why, like, what is happening? Why is there this weird group dynamic at work as opposed to us just like talking about ideas or like, I, I think government should be fairly quotidian. We should be arguing about what's efficient and optimum and stuff. And, and but uh, I, I got very interested in it because I had to. And then that turned into yeah. a really interesting. And then academic. on the other hand, most single women in New York City at that time didn't know what the word quotidian meant. <laughs> um, I wouldn't know, Justin, because they were not going out with me that year. Uh, that was <laughs> that was that was not a great year for the heat and dating life. Uh, and uh, uh, but yeah, I got into it. Then I got fascinated by a bunch of stuff. I got really fascinated by prehistory, uh, uh, evolutionary history, um, what what little evolutionary psychology we can infer from the data, and uh, and and you know feel like me and about I don't know thousand other people are all kind of trying to get get the country aware of this phenomena that's going on so that we can we can get to a better place. Just kind of nudge the galleon in a better direction.
Nudge the Galleon. That's what they're calling it today. <laughs> Nudge the Galleon, which is something I also didn't get to do in 2017. <laughs> Uh, there's just not a lot of nudging going on. The, 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 the galleon remained nudgeless yeah, for old nudge, Andy Heats. A nudgeless galleon, just just frigidly pushing through the Arctic waters. <laughs> just, just no wind for the nudgeless galleon, just stuck awkwardly bobbing alone at the center of the center of the lake. <laughs> Uh, so uh, so uh, it got published when and... Uh, today. You were the first program that I have gone on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, came out today. And uh, yeah, I'll be doing the rounds over the next few weeks. And uh, I wanted it to come out before the election. I, I think um, now is peak crazy for people. Now, now is the, the, the period where people are truly going to feel the most threatened by external groups. And they're going to be the most groupish in their mentality. And so for folks that uh, are struggling with their aunt or their mom or their dad or their best friend that like wh why is it that our relationship is so fraught now i have not changed you've not changed why is this a problem now because all this weird group external stuff is happening and it's making everybody freak out and there's a reason for it there's evolutionary reasons for it it's built into us and so what i want to do is give people the tools necessary to understand the situation and i i can't inoculate you but i can give you some diagnostics that will allow you to understand the situation and, and hopefully deal with it better. At the very least, take it less personal. Be able to be able to comport yourself with a little bit more ease. Do, do is this is this more of a uh, comedy book or or is there lots of of uh, how how much of of their of the book is stories of awkward cocktail parties that you've had to endure? Uh, I mean, and and I'm hoping plenty of it because I'm here for the heating of it all. Th this is uh, about and also on the other on the other side. How much of your awkward need to be validated as a funny person is going to get in the way of the awesome research you did about the human experience? <laughs> like, Man, two hard hitting questions. Yeah, yeah. The, the answer is both. Uh, I, I'd say it's probably about 70 30. 70% 70 substantive, 30% funny. So it's it's a layer. I'm, I'm communicating it glibly, but it's not like. It's not like comedy chapters that have a thing at the end. They're like, like I'm, I'm getting into actual research and explaining it, explaining the concepts. But I'm also aware that uh, I'm not a PhD or an academic. Uh, I'm not, I'm not somebody that that would usually have a lot of cachet in terms of this expertise. So what I'm trying to kind of position myself as is a funnier, less successful well, version well, it, uh of. Jonathan Haidt or Steven Pinker or somebody like that. So I am funnier than them. I'm not as successful or intelligent, but, well, I, but I'm trying to add a layer of glibness to the sort of stuff they're doing. Well, I, and you've mentioned that you're excited about having a legitimate kind of kind of keystone to get you in the door as a pundit uh, on thinky shows. Uh, I feel like we should run a simulation of what it's going to be like. Sure. And, and uh, your job is to wedge in. Uh, like, we'll tee you up with a very common thing that you could expect from these shows, and you are going to seamlessly take whatever the question is okay. and just kind of pivot it to, uh, uh, oh, that's a great question. It reminds me of this thing from the book, or, or mm -hmm. but, but a little bit better, right? I love this. This, okay. is, this is a, a, a fun, galleonless kind of role play we can do together. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. It's time to nudge that galleon, dude. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. let's nudge that nudge galleon. Nudge that galleon. <laughs> nudge that galleon. <laughs> Get ready to <laughs> nudge that galleon all night long. <laughs> Scientists say that galleons are getting nudged left and right. <laughs> to help give us the inside rudder, we contacted Andrew Heaton. Oh, the, the, the author. Pleasure to be aboard, Dana. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and my co-host, Gertrude, uh, uh -huh. had a question for you. Great to see you, Gertrude. I forgot what the game was. Oh, what the game was. The game? was man, we, I got we, lost we, thinking about galleons, man. <laughs> I got to tell you, I was all in on this galleon thing. I was thinking about, like, what do they call the rivets on them? And, like, is it brass on the, on a galleon? Like, how do you nudge it? Would, you, would it be nudged from, like, an invisible finger that would come out from heaven like God? Or would it be, are we just no. talking about wind? I was just thinking a lot about galleons, and I totally <laughs> fucked up this improv. So well, the, the, the good news is, the second half of the book, if you even get that far, is just galleon porn. The last 50% the last of the book, like, I, I shouldn't say this. This is, this is the truth. Nonfiction, no one actually reads nonfiction books the whole way through. Like, uh, like if, you've, if you've ever yeah. taken a crack at... Uh, um, Stephen Hawking, uh, brief history. The, the the second half of it's porn. It's just complete porn. But no one no one's ever read the whole book. 
So you so say yeah. with me. Is it fifty percent galleon porn? It's a bodice rip percent should've, on a should've, galleon. Should should have seen the Epstein shit coming then. Yeah, that's yeah yeah. Probably should have seen that. He was yeah. leaving clues. He was leaving <laughs> clues the whole time. Uh, so so uh, uh, I, I, I is that your answer to the question about galleons? Well, I, I feel like we kind of got off track before the game itself happened, and so I was I was playing with that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I all right, what, all right, can you tee right. up another one for me? Okay. All right. All right. All right. We'll give it another try. Uh, 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 Justin, bring us in on this one. New new environment. Fabergé eggs. We love them. You need them. <laughs> We're here to discuss the latest in Fabergé eggs. They call us the Egg Boys. The mm -hmm. F F Egg Boys. The Feg Boys are here. I'm Feg Number One. Joined by my co-host, Feg number two. What hey, up? Uh, uh, number one, uh, uh, you know what? I feel like I'm out of my depth on this one. That's why we got the author of Tribalism is Dumb. Uh -huh. Let's hear it for Andrew Heaton. Heaton, you want to clear all this up for us? Yeah, pleasure to be here on this Fabergé egg-themed <laughs> program. I have a lot of thoughts. Mm -hmm. I think I can weigh in. Uh, the, the first one is, you know, a lot of people hate Fabergé eggs. Uh, it's surprising, I know. It's surprising, but a lot of people hate them. And part of that is cultural because Fabergé eggs are associated with Russia. Now, you and I would go, well, that's it's just aesthetic. It doesn't have anything to do with geopolitics at all. But there's this part of human beings that wants to be on a team and hate another team. And so they look at Fabergé and they go, well, that's the Ruskies. I want nothing to do with that. And so what I'm trying to do in my book is get past that, past that, that just kind of knee-jerk groupish response and be able to understand that there's a difference between group identity and whether or not you like Fabergé eggs and get to what the actual differences are so that we can work through them. Well, where, where, where does that come from, this, this need to to uh, want to hate someone else? That's a great question. Specifically this, eggs. Specifically, specifically eggs. eggs. Well, okay, so. you know, we can talk about eggs in terms of resources and explain this question. Then. So th this, is, this is my personal theory that I, I put in the book, is uh, I think that there's evolutionary pressure on human beings going back quite a long way to proactively look for enemy teams to vanquish. I don't like it, but I think it's wired into us. The reason that I think that is we've got very good evidence that the human population is bottlenecked under very extreme conditions two, two or three times over the course of our history. That if we go back to our antecedents, uh, Homo, uh, Homo ergaster, Homo heidelbergensis, like human, humans that were more rudimentary than us, but they had fire, they cooked their food, they walked around, they probably talked. The, the human population dropped down for 80,000 years to about 20,000 people. We were, we were an endangered species for a very, very, very long period of time. We get out of that again, and we're now uh, human beings as we now have us, uh, Homo sapiens. And yet again, there's a super volcano. It goes off in, in Indonesia. I don't want to say anything bad about Indonesia, but apparently they're not very good at volcano maintenance. Their volcano goes off. There's global, uh, uh, global winter. Um, and... Uh, um, the population declines again. There's about 10,000 years where the human population is about that of Bixby, Oklahoma today. We're, we're an endangered species. There's been multiple times where human beings have been an endangered species. And during those periods of time where we were under very, very tight, very, very difficult <laughs> resource <laughs> competition, I think probably made sense to be cooperative within your group, but for your group to ward off any potential rivals to any calories that are there. So if both of us come into the same field and there's berries, whoever's more aggressive and whoever's looking for a potential bad guy to fight is probably going to keep those berries. So I think it's hardwired in us to be proactive, to look for any threat to our resources. Now, the good news is we don't have to worry about that today. We've got berries. We've got bison. We're not starving to death. We're, we're living in a world where we can grow the Hell pie yeah. rather than divide it. But we're still wired that way. We're wired to anticipate a threat to our tribe. And as human beings, we care about three things very, very importantly deep down. Not dying, passing on our genes, and our tribe. The tribe is just as important. The health of the tribe, the life of the tribe is just as important as avoiding death and mating and, but, and it's still in us. And uh, I'm slipping dangerously into an actual interview. Um, the, uh, Wait, real quick. I've done a great job of, of pivoting away from the Fabergé egg questions into the book. Which that brings like me back to my question. That is like gubernatorial level pivoting right there. All right. Answer me this. What came first? The Fabergé <laughs> egg or the Fabergé chicken? <laughs> <laughs> well, as we all know, 
Fabergé chickens were, of course, genetically engineered by czarist scientists in 1842 from a variant of Ukrainian game hens. So the Damn chicken right. did come first, and they shit out sequined eggs, which is where Fabergé eggs come from. That's All excellent. right, plug your book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> land, land, land the plug. Land oh, the plug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Buy my book for more interesting facts about Fabergé eggs. Tribalism is dumb, which you can get on Amazon or also Amazon. Audible. 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 Yeah. Nobody, nobody reads. Nobody reads. And I and uh, by uh, the way, I'm reading the audio book too. So if you like my voice, I'm the one doing it. Oh, that's great, dude. I'm I'm so proud of you on this. I know that you've put a ton of work into it, and it has been uh, a, a a gigantic passion project that you have uh, sweat blood into. I think everyone's going to enjoy it. I know I am definitely going to enjoy it, uh, uh, and we will do our best to push that motherfucker as high as we can on the Amazon charts because uh, you know, this this is the first like for real like the political orphanage book that. I think you've written since I've been friends with you. I don't think you've ever, I mean, you've, you've written this, funny this books and you've written only uh, real uh, book. Uh, this is the only serious book I've written or, or substantive book I've written. I've written a couple of novels. I wrote a very fun short story collection and I, and I've written some funny stuff, but this is the only thing that has like substance to it. This is the only meal as opposed to dessert yeah. that I've made. And uh, is very, very much compatible with a political orphanage. A lot, a lot of the, a lot of the people that I've interviewed on the program are are foundational texts in the book that I'm I'm referencing and I'm sorting in, in my own uh, like a significant amount of the political orphanage is in reality me doing research for the book that just came out and I just happen to record it for the benefit of listeners. I think it's a really great time to release it too because you're going to have two very specific audiences. The audience that's really going to love it right now are the sober people at prom. <laughs> who are like, oh my god, I can't believe everybody else is acting so weird. Aren't we like, don't don't we have a unique experience into this? Like, let's understand why they are being odd. Uh, and then in about two months, you're going to have everybody who's hung over from being drunk on tribalism for a year and a half. They're going to be looking at their lives and being like, half of them will have lost. And they're going to just be like, what have I done? <laughs> what have I done to myself? What have I done to my existence? Like this is pathetic. Like I gotta, I gotta watch more British Bake Off. This is fucked up. And uh, and they're gonna have that book. Someone's gonna recommend that book. I'm like, well, why did I go into this berserker mode where I was, uh, uh, you know, screaming and yelling about a, a poll that was taken with a seven person sample size? Uh, you will be there to explain it to them. And I, I could not be more thrilled to tell everybody that tribalism is dumb. That is a book by Andrew Eaton. Thank you. And I think you're absolutely right about that. I think that the people that are buying it right now are the ones that are are mystified or bothered by the uh, temperature in the room. And I, I have lots of friends that are in the other camp where about six months after the last election, they went, that I, I maybe went a bit hard there. You know, when I when I drove my truck through someone's yard to knock over political signs, in retrospect, that didn't accomplish anything. It didn't help the neighborhood cohesion very much. And yeah, the book will be there for them when they when they finish up. Maybe it'll give them a little bit more sobriety in the following. Ooh, this is going to be a great thing. If you want to give a passive aggressive, you need to calm down gift. Oh this wow. Christmas. Yeah, I love that. You should be doing that. You should be doing that it's on the a orphanage. Spite gift. Yeah. Write in the the uh, uh, the 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 relative that you think needs this book the most, and and tell me that you are getting it for them for Christmas, and just make that a thing Ooh, I weekly, like that. where where you just say like, uh, look, man. I would, I would use an example in Brian's family, but I, I don't know if it would be appropriate to say the name of the member of Brian's family <laughs> that is way too tuned up on 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 politics right now in, in a way that is detrimental to the family. I bet, I like, bet people can guess. <laughs> I, I I I love this idea because already I've 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 done I've just talked to you right, and I was pitching it as for you, the reader, but. Maybe you don't need it. Maybe this should be a passive-aggressive gift for the most irritating person in your life but, uh, when it comes to politics. I love that. Someone Pro you love, someone you love that uh -huh. you want the old them back, and and maybe they can benefit from just kind of understanding how we get here. Uh, yeah. But, yeah uh, pro tip: uh, uh, either hand it to them saying. Uh, man, I read this book and it made me think about what's so great about our friendship is that we don't let our divides get between us. I think you'll really like it. 
Maybe. Or if you can't bring yourself to say that because things are so acrimonious, then you then hand them the book and say, this book made things so much better. I don't get mad when other people are wrong anymore. Thanks to this book. Uh, that way. The, uh, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, we, we have a great suggestion here in the uh, in, in, in the chat. Uh, Heaton, uh, you should send a couple copies to our friends at the uh, Libertarian Party of New Hampshire. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I might, I might do. I might do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would imagine that they might send it back with a few choice words <laughs> written on the front of it. But, but maybe you'll get into that Twitter, and that's good promo. It's I true. mean, if, 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 if they, 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 they call you the F slur on that uh, on that Twitter account, you might move some units. That, that's true. And th- this is also an int- a, a good book for me, where even if it fails. If people get mad at me, they'll be doing it for the the right reason. Like, if anybody gets really, I don't like you trying to make America less angry. All right. I'm willing to do that. Well, what are you up to, pal? What are you doing? Oh, uh, see, that was a test. That was a test. Uh, yeah, uh, Wallace, the, Wallace the, is just the, exploring the space. Don't 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 mind him, none. I, I think he found the secret trap door <laughs> uh, in, in your stage where you keep the gold and the bodies. What are you doing, Wallace? Hey, Wallace. Hi. Hi, Wallace. Come here. Hey, bud. <laughs> what, are you doing? what are you doing? TV's really changed you, Wallace. You used to be cool. I know. Yeah. So, so do you ever give a tip of the hat to any uh, upsides to tribalism yeah. or situations yeah, yeah, in which yeah, yeah. that for, was the most effective heuristic? For sure. I think. I think. Uh, I mean, I, I'm using the word tribalism pejoratively, but 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 uh, tribalism in a broad sense, there's wonderful, wonderful elements to it. I mean, we're. Uh, uh, we're we're individuals, but but socially we don't exist as individuals. We we operate as in a group. Um, uh, the, the the human experience is one that's very very rich because of the group dynamics that we have. The the tribalism that we have in us we have because it was a very good social tool. Um, so outside of us fighting other tribes, uh, outside of that, going way back to when we're we're sharing ancestors with chimps and things like that. Part of the evolutionary strategy that we as human beings have adopted is having the benefit of a tribe. That if, if we're these little monkey creatures living in the Serengeti 400 million years ago, and you know, we can get plucked off by, by tigers and, and lions and things, but if we all kind of band together, we're all in the same area, then there's, there's, uh, there's other members of the tribe that are watching out for threats. You can, you can uh, uh, have, have your, your kids, your progeny being watched where you're not watching them all the time. When we get into the human period, late in the game from an evolutionary standpoint, we can pass on very useful knowledge by virtue of being in a tribe. That, that you know, if we were just, if we were a solitary species like the cursed orangutans, they're not able to pass on any cultural knowledge because they just basically get, get a, they get together to cronk and then they go back to playing solitaire by themselves. So there's really, really beneficial things to the tribe from that standpoint. And, and you get wonderful feelings from it. Like, I, I don't really get a, a, a good sports vibe. But I, I wish I did. I wish I did, truly. I think my life would be more rich. But I can get something like that when I'm singing in a group of people. Uh, I, I, w- I went to a choir event uh, yesterday, un- unrelated, for the political orphanage. And it was wonderful. That sense of, of being in, in part of a, a large group of people. And uh, um, so, yeah, I, I think that there's really, really healthy, good, wonderful variants of the tribe. The, the problem that I see is that we're funneling those good instincts into bad or inappropriate places in the same way that there's nothing wrong or prurient about uh, wanting to mate, about being sexually attracted to people. That, that's fine on a, on a basic level, but we do kind of have to go, look, you can't do it when you're flying a plane. You can't do it in traffic. You, like Pussy. there's yeah, there, there are certain places to do it. And I, I, I think part of the big problem is that uh, a lot of those healthy manifestations of tribe have declined or atrophied over the last 50 years. And that the last man standing is politics. And so very alienated, very lonely people that aren't getting that healthy tribe that you ask about, Brian, they're increasingly turning to politics as an alternate source of tribal identity and tribal connection. And I think that that's very bad. I think that that is a, an understandable thing for people to do but what it ends up happening is 
Politics goes from something that really ought to be fairly boring problem solving, and it turns into a kind of clash of the titans, where now whenever you and I are having a conversation about taxes, we're not talking about taxes, we're talking about whose team is evil and whose team is good, and that makes it very, very difficult to actually run the country. It makes it difficult for us to get along. So, Well, and, and I guess, I guess uh, uh, the subtitle says uh, uh, where it came from, how it got so bad, and what to do about it. Uh, give us a taste of the what to do about it, because uh, if somebody has spent half a decade, or I guess, what, eight years now, uh, or 10 years, a full decade, because it started before the election, you know, ramping up, getting excited about bubbling themselves in one uh, a, a group of imaginary friends to be their tribe. How how do, uh, and that is, that is uh, both sides, um, uh, how, how does one replace those empty calories with something more culturally nutritious? Yeah, I think if, if you're, there, there's data that's come out that kind of blew my mind. Um, I think it's Ryan Streeter over at AEI did some surveys, did some studies where he found that people that report being lonely are seven times more likely to be political, which I find are being politically active, which I, I find very telling that there's a lot of people that are <laughs> very, very obvious. <laughs> yes. Uh, and it and it's and. Uh, I, I think that it, for people that are doing that, that are using politics as an ersatz, er, ersatz tribe, um, anything, li literally anything, would, would be beneficial that you can be a, a member of a group for. Uh, that you could do in addition, you can still do the political stuff. I'm not saying that's bad uh, in and of itself, but but you want to be able to balance that out with some other kind of identity, some other kind of tribe, and it has uh, ameliorative aspects to it as well. In that, if if you and I are part of the same joggers group or we go to the same church, or something like that, we get to know each other as individuals, and that has a humanizing effect. When it turns out that I'm a Democrat and you're a Republican, I can, I can then begin to cognitively interpret that and go, well, that's weird that he's not in the same political clique as me, but I know he's a good person, so I now have to figure out some kind of a model in my mind where you're a good person and I disagree with you, which I, I think is where we need to be. Um, so, yeah, I, I think like for, for people that are that are starving socially, yeah, trying to join other things that aren't political, finding other things is, is a, a good way to do that. For those of us that um, have more more healthy social lives, I think one of the things we can do is have a golden bridge available for people that we disagree with. Uh, one of the phenomenon that happens, uh, 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 our friend David McRaney talks a lot about this in his book, is that when uh, when, when you're part of a, an ideological clique, you feel as if you are going to lose all of your friends. You're going to lose that social connection if you leave it. So having people go like, hey, like, I like you regardless of what your politics are. Like if you quit your politics, I'd still be friends with you. That gives people an opportunity to, to kind of play with uh, ab abandoning old positions and, and, and take it a little bit more at arm's length. Yeah, the... Um, <clears throat> uh uh, when you, uh, that that golden bridge is is something that uh, Martin Luther King was is uh, known for doing, where it's like uh, wherever the divide is, he would just increasingly draw a bigger circle where we're back to shoulder to shoulder in the same tribe. Well, and, he was the one that could read minds, not the one right. who could yeah. bend metal. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. We're walking around with lists all the time. He, well, well, <laughs> what Martin Luther King uh, Jr. did, uh, one of the many things that he did, but from a tribal perspective, what he did that was wonderful was he was always focusing on common humanity as opposed to common enemy. So one, one of the, the tricks that we have as a species to get around the fact that we are uh, predisposed towards parochial, we, we, our, our native unit of group is about 150 people, and anything beyond that, uh, we run into scaling issues. And one of the really easy ways to get around that is like, I don't, I don't know that guy, I don't know that guy, but my God, we're going to fight the Babylonians together. We can't trust those Babylonians. Having an external threat is something that animates people as having a sense of social cohesion. And leaders know this, by the way. Political operatives know this. They know that if they can get you afraid and angry and scared of what they purport to be an existential threat, that you're going to lock arms with the other people in your party. They know this. They, they want that to happen. Martin Luther King Jr. was forever expanding the definition of American, expanding the definition of, of humanity. He, he wasn't saying, join us to go fight the other guy. He was saying, look, we're, we're all a part of this thing, and I want you to come join me, and I want you to let me into your tent. He was always doing that. He's a wonderful man in that regard. Uh, the problem that I see with politics is that from the moral perspective, it really should only take about five minutes. It's like you should say, oh, there's an election. Really? Oh, well, I wonder what I believe in. Oh, let me look this up. Oh, yeah, I'm going to vote for this side. 
Uh, probably not going to change my decision all that much throughout my life because I don't think these core values are going to particularly change. If they do, boy, it'll be something that I think a lot more about because it's going to be a monumental moment. Okay, well, we're done. The, the, the problem is that when you take that five-minute journey and make it a four-year experience, morally, it is intensely trying. And I think it's yeah. something that frays people emotionally because it's hard to keep that kind of uh, uh, vigor. Now, it, it's not to say that that hasn't always been there. Politics throughout most of my lifetime was pretty much dominated by two communities, nearly specifically, the nerds and the cranks. Yeah, There were yeah, like yeah. wonks who cared about public policy or really liked elections like I do and, and really cared about history. And so you, you'd spend the time kind of keeping tabs on stuff, but it doesn't take a whole lot of housekeeping to know, be up to date on politics. And then you'd read about history or you'd study public policy and stuff like that. Or you're the crank and you know a crank the time that they put the third bumper sticker yeah. on their <laughs> car. Like, right. as soon as the third one goes on, congratulations, you get a letter in the mail. You're a crank, and you're the guy who uh, uh, stands up and screams, uh, vote for John Kerry at the end of Bowling for Columbine, <laughs> uh, an actual thing that happened when I saw Bowling for Columbine. Wow. Uh, like, like that's, But that used to be it, and now yeah. it's like, it's, it, it is an expectation in polite society that you need to be consuming a lot of political content, which I do think stokes tribalism in, in, a, in a fairly unhealthy way, because again, it's, you know, five minutes for most normies, 99% of the world. It's, 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 it's five minutes. It, I'm it, a Democrat. I'm a Republican. It used to Here be that go. way. And Boom. I think it was much better that way. So um, I, I was surprised maybe when I was in high school or college, when I when was kind of first becoming politically aware, I, I grew up in Oklahoma, the holster of the Bible belt. My, my relatives are, are much more conservative than I am, like, like ha have been when I was a conservative, definitely are now. And I was surprised to discover that most of my relatives are Democrats. And because in, in the 90s, 2000s, the, the Republicans were the conservative party. And so it was very strange to me that they were Democrats. But as I, as I talked to them more, it became apparent that for them, this was a pretty meaningless identity point. That they had, at some point in their history, they went, I got to register with a party. Oklahoma's a one-party state, Democrat, when, when they came in. And so I'm going to register as Democrat. But for them, it was a fairly bureaucratic paperwork thing. It really had very little to do. Like, they were much more concerned about religious identity. They were much more concerned about geographic identity. At some point, that, that partisan identity really shifted in terms of importance for people. And uh, I, I'm, I'm with you, too, Justin, like that, that sense that you need to be operating politically all the time. Right before I left uh, Washington, D.C., I think the flight out of Washington, D.C., when I was working as a, as a staffer for Congress, um, now, I, I was working for moderate Democrats at the time. I was a moderate Democrat at the time. I really did not like the Tea Party because they were flushing out a lot of the people that I was working for. And I was getting on this flight back to Oklahoma, and there was a guy sitting next to me, looked to be maybe like 65-year-old farmer, and I just wanted to fight him. I just wanted to get into a fight and tell him what an idiot he was and all that stuff. So I started kind of prodding him on it. I'm like, why are you up here? And he's like, well, you know, I'm up here for a political thing. And I knew it was the Tea Party rally. And, and, uh, and, and eventually I went, well, so, you know, are you a Republican then? And he went, uh, you know, son, I, I appreciate your interest in me, but I've, I've just been brought up to, to think that it's impolite to discuss politics and religion with strangers. So I, I don't think I'll talk to you about that, but we can discuss something else. And I, I thought about it. I went, I'm the dickhead here. I'm the one being yeah. the asshole. Like, I'm this, the baddie. This guy's fine. He's just sitting there. And, I, and I, I think that that position that I was taking, in which I now recognize I was being the asshole, has become much more commonplace. And it's become much more normal for people to be openly antagonistic and to seek out people to lock horns with in this kind of performative tribal proxy war. So what's the well, solution? Uh, there's there's several uh, good news bad news um, uh, bad news is I think the main instigating factor for the the increase that we've seen in tribalism the last few years is technological there's lots of different theories of, of why this is happening and uh, I, I think they're probably a little bit of several different things but the, the main one I think that's happening is technological the reason that I say that is that we've got other data points we can look at to compare to ourselves so some of the theories that you see floating around the United States tend to be recycled uh, political 
fights. So if you're a, a progressive, you might say the problem is that we have a, a, we have a bad economy that is, uh, there's a lot of inequality, and the inequality is making people um, uh, more political and angry. And so just do, do what I want as a progressive, it'll go away. Or you might have conservatives saying the problem is that we, we do, the, the states are doing less and less, the federal government's doing more, there's wedge issues. If you just vote for me, the states' rights guy, then it would all go away. And then the libertarians would get the problem is the government, blah, blah, blah. Basically, uh, there's a lot of people that are, that are fielding theories, and I think they really believe them, that the problem is your team screwed up the country, and if you vote for my team, the tribalism will go away. And I, I think that that's tautological in terms of its analysis. And we can look at other countries that are part of the developed world that we're, we're buddies with that are going through the same thing. Uh, you look at France. France has very different labor law than the United States. It has a different electoral system than the United States. Some of the electoral things that I'm pushing, like, like ranked choice voting, is, is done over in, in their federal elections. And I don't and they think, fixed everything. They fixed everything. I, I don't think anybody in France would say that the election between Macron and Le Pen was a love fest. Uh, Britain has a different Damn. electoral system than we do. They don't. They don't have the electoral college. They don't have any. And yet, their their Brexit debate was very, very acrimonious. And you go to like a cute little social democracy that's fairly homogenous, like the Netherlands, and they've had incredible rancor in their politics. So I, I think it's something that has to transcend the socioeconomic and it has to transcend the political electoral systems. And the, the unifying factor that I can identify is technological. So what I think is the main factor here is that we've, we've got new forms of communication and we, we've not had society adapt to them fast enough. I think that this is probably most similar to when the printing press was invented, when, the, uh, when, when not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther was promulgating his ideas during the Reformation. He wasn't promulgating any new ideas. Those ideas had all been previously supposed by people like John Wycliffe, but previously the Catholic Church had been able to suppress them and, and you know light the guy on fire as a heretic or if not burn whatever documents. When the printing press was invented, Martin Luther could, could put out ideas faster than they could be destroyed, and that led to about 300 years of incredibly bloody religious warfare in, in Europe. And uh, in, in our current situation, we've got a, a glut of information. There's more information that's published every day than was published the year I was born. Um, there's, there's more information published every 10 minutes than existed in the entire library of Alexandria. So we're, we're awash in all this data, and people rationally default on their tribe to sort it for them. They go, I can't read 15 newspapers, so I'm just going to pick one I politically agree with, and I'll trust they're right. I mean, I, I, in a non-political way, I mean, as something as, as silly as like uh, TV shows and movies, it's like I'll see a preview and I'll think, I really want to watch that, and then I'll wait, and then it's like, oh, that came and went, and I didn't watch it, including like a remake of Time Bandits by Taika Waititi. On paper, I should have been nuts for it, but quite simply, nobody in my tribe said it's pretty good, and as a result, I never... I never took a action on that. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, there's, 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 there's. <laughs> sorry, I got distracted by one of the comments. Uh, um, there's, there's a ton of stuff. That, like, like that's part of it is that we're in a glut. Uh, what one of the other things is that as as uh, very pro-social apes, we we have a lot of wiring that makes us uh, get along with people in the room. Uh, we we don't want to pick fights with strangers, even strangers from other tribes. We want to get along. That part of our brain that's really good at censoring uh, acrimonious, bad, negative behavior doesn't get clicked in when you're looking at a screen. The mammal part of your brain that's in charge of regulating your social interactions, it, it does not understand when you're looking at a screen that that is a person. It thinks you're looking at a light bulb that has some wiggly lines on it. And so we, we have a lot of censorship issues, I should say self-censorship issues, that have come out because of technology where, I, 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 in my experience, I think you guys would agree with me. I think most, uh, most of the people watching would agree with me. Most of the awful shit I see in terms of political discourse is online. I don't actually encounter that much of it in person. Some, but most of it's online. I think that's partly because we've got this medium. We haven't developed new ways of dealing with it. And then there's a lot of stuff that, that Justin would actually be much better at describing than me, which is that the, the media landscape has changed over the last 20, 30 years. We've, uh, once, once cable television came out nationally around 1980 with CNN, you saw the shift away from 
nightly news that was fairly local. You got more and more national news, and it needed to be, uh, once we got 24-hour news, you couldn't do an hour-long recap. You had to keep people there 24 hours a day, which meant you had to do all sorts of very uh, emotionally evocative content. And what's emotionally evocative? Tribalism is emotionally evocative. So I, I think a lot of it's technological. And this is why it's, the sad thing about this is I think it'll just require time for people to come to terms with what has now happened and develop social mores which govern it. But some of the things that we could do um, in terms of lowering the temperature, I do think electoral reform would help. I think it would, it would do, it would, I don't think it's the principle. Like in France? Ha! Some of the stuff, like, I, I think it, one of the, one of the difficulties I found writing Super this book Super calm is, over there. <laughs> yeah. They definitely don't just stop working every five minutes because there's mad about shit all the time yeah. thank god they got that ranked choice voting right. just to even everything yeah, yeah. famously calm french people famously fob yeah yeah uh, i i don't disagree that that um uh, the fact that there are other countries going through this would disprove that that's a silver bullet i don't think it's a silver mm. bullet but what i what i uh, and i'll back up a little bit uh, one of the frustrating things about this project was that there's not good international data on this uh, the surveys of like, do you hate the other party? Do you fear the other party? We don't have the same surveys from country to country, which means we can't compare them. So there's no way for me to. Object and in the French ones, it's just like 35 percent. Ha ha ha. Yeah. What it's just, does it just mean? A picture How of two people having sex while smoking data. a cigarette, uh, leaning outside of a building at a soccer <laughs> riot is not very useful, right? Uh, it's like, oh, wait, 15%? Why don't I just fuck the American abroad? Like, <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, so I, like, I, I take your point, and I, I think that your point is valid. But what, what I can tell you is that when we, when we boil down or drill down in the statistics here in the United States, the average Republican and the average Democrat are a lot more moderate than the politicians representing them and are more complex in their views, or at least more scattershot in their views, than the media that they're listening to. With both journalists and politicians, there's much more emphasis on ideological identity, and there tends to be a lot more clearly, uh, uh, I'm a conservative, I'm a progressive, within those, those elite ranks of politicians, journalists. A average Americans are a lot more moderate, a lot more consensus when you look at all of the available data. And so if you had a system that was less first past the polls, open primaries, ranked choice voting, you would find candidates that are more consensus. And you'd find um, a lot more moderate Republicans or moderate Democrats running instead of our current system where we wind up getting King Joffrey or Ramsey Bolton. And those of us in the middle have to choose between them. So I think there You're are things to find a do. new metaphor because that show has been off the air. For a oh, also, yeah, did, right. didn't end so hot. I mean, uh, uh, nobody has really great taste in their mouth after that, especially the people sucking dick. Yeah, plus you're right. Plus, especially plus, those, uh, especially the dick suckers. The dick suckers. Will no one think of the dick suckers? Yeah, good point. Yeah, in these trying times. Plus, uh, Khaleesi was kind of a third party candidate and went off the rails, right? So maybe, maybe I should drop she that. Metaphor, did. Yeah, she went yeah, it was a bad straight idea. fascist. Yeah, but I, I think what happened to the, to, to the Dothraki? A lot of people don't think about that. Yeah, what did they? They, <laughs> they, they real Glocknar's taint. They, they've. <laughs> Integrated into the city, uh, uh, briefly had a spot of organized crime, then became uh, legitimate members of the community. Now a pillar. Great, then great Dothraki food. Then that was it. All right. So uh, uh, tribalism is dumb. Buy it right now. Everybody go buy it. Also, patreon.com slash great night is where you go if you want the bonus episode of this show thank you so much for supporting it we are there for you with a bonus episode we call it the bones every single motherfucking thursday and we had a great one on on this thursday it ended a little early because brian had to go to the eye doctor but and i was late but uh, uh <laughs> but it was a really 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 fun time uh, uh, i've really enjoyed the bones lately thank you guys for supporting uh, uh the show and uh yeah there you go wait a minute did uh did i not post the bones <laughs> uh chat chat did i did i forget to post the bones because i remember i had to run oh fuck the bones <laughs> was not Boy, posted do do we have a treat for you guys <laughs> <laughs> are you gonna love your rss feed if you're a patron oh it's oh not too oh late hold on. The fucking, <laughs> we're gonna open the fucking the kimono here brian's gotta run uh, no look i'm late so i'm gonna go ahead and take 
half blame for this because I am late to the point where we are going to have to be, uh, uh, it's going to be a shorter episode and Brian's going to have to bolt as soon as humanly possible to go get uh, uh, this eye exam, right? However, when he does, you can even hear it in the episode when you listen to it, uh, he goes, hey, can you just throw all this equipment inside and, and I'll take care of it? And I'm like, cool. So when I bring it inside, I'm like, well, do I take the memory card out and put it somewhere? Nope. Too subtle. Brian will forget about it. <laughs> I'll leave all of the unspooled equipment in the chair that he is sitting in right now. There's no way he can ignore that. He will see the gigantic sprawl of equipment and say, oh, shit, I need to post the bones. So bring me into your world, Brian. You uh, walk I mean, in, you see all the equipment in the chair, and what do you think? You know what? You don't need to be blindfolded. You don't need to put your prediction in an envelope. I'm pretty sure everybody out there can close their eyes, and in their mind's eye, they can visualize Brian coming in saying, ooh, ooh, this is very important. I need to get to this. Let me just scoot this over for a second. <laughs> do, 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 do. The end. <laughs> uh, and now we're here. And then, <laughs> he was a little Spanish lead. <laughs> da, 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 da. Da, da, da. Day goes into night, day goes into night, day goes into night, day goes into night, and now we're here. Um, that, do that man is my exact double. That dog has a puffy tail. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, great oh, news. It's Jesus. not too late to join, catch the wave of Patreon. Everyone's going to Patreon. Patreon, the... The direction's flowing to patreon.com slash great night. Justin, you had an announcement. Oh. <laughs> yeah, PX3's on Substack now. <laughs> uh, Justin, can I, can I ask you a question about uh, PX3 being on Substack? Uh, yeah, uh, you can ask me a question about PX3 available on Substack right now. Brand new tier. In fact, uh, uh, you can get a year of the premium bonus content of px3 for 99 dollars, 150 episodes for under 100 dollars, only until halloween go ahead out there get that in your life uh you know faberge eggs have become such a really <laughs> sore spot with people what a, yeah. as the head of p as the host of px3 politics mm -hmm. politics politics which is now on Substack, yeah what can you mm -hmm. tell us about the acrimony surrounding the faberge egg crisis uh you know the faberge egg community is a very specific one ornate are these eggs and they are truly high art and and that's the the way that i tend to think of for example uh, the New York Times Siena poll, which uh, today showed that Donald Trump was leading Kamala Harris by 13 points. And tomorrow's episode of PX3 featuring Evan Scrimshaw, we're going to say that while we do believe that Donald Trump is going to win in Florida, a 13-point victory, which would be more akin to something like Alabama or Mississippi, is probably a little bit far-fetched. So looping it back to Fabergé eggs, obviously there's a lot of consternation, but there's conflict that you can see in the community that I think is probably healthy. Hmm. Nice. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry where, where can I hear this interview? Uh, that'll be on uh, the first episode of uh, PX3. That'll be on Substack. That'll be free. It's, if, you, if you're subscribed to PX3 for free on any podcasting app, Everything's going to come out the exact same way that it's always come out. Nothing will change at all whatsoever. The only thing that's different is that if you were on Patreon and you want the bonus content that will be coming out, uh, then you should go to uh, 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 Patreon. Just look for Politics, Politics, Politics on, on Substack and get that. Or check your email right now. There's an email from uh, uh, Substack, uh, from my Substack, uh, you were all imported it imported in. You can get f the next month of content if you were on Patreon. The next month of content is comped by Substack, so you will get the bonus stuff. Uh, just enter in the custom RSS feed into your uh, into the the podcast player of your choice, and then update your information at some point between now and Election Day. Justin, it sounds like for people that are already subscribed to Politics, Politics, Politics on Patreon, that this has been completely greenlit for them and that all they need do is, is 
click the button that you've sent them to be onboarded and grandfathered into this process, and they can continue supporting your show and getting bonus content, perhaps with a better platform in the mix? 100%. And uh, let me tell you this. I have been talking to Substack for two weeks. I have had more conversations about how and why we are going to grow my show as a platform and as a program than I have ever had with any other platform uh, uh, whatsoever. Um, let's, let's say, hopefully, you never know, but hopefully there will be pretty immediate dividends to uh, uh, getting on getting on that platform, and and I'll I'll just say, from my perspective, Substack is about culture, politics, and technology right now. Those are the three things that people are making on it. Uh, it's designed for writers and podcasters, and it's surfacing at all times content. You can live on that app. And I would say you'll, you'll have a better time to the stuff that Heaton was talking about in terms of tribalism. Substack is kind of free of a lot of the pressures of like ad supported stuff. Yeah. Like this is, I'm going to produce quality shit to the point where you're going to do something really hard, which is jump over a paywall. Um, and if, uh, uh, you know, that means you got to work really good. I mean, and, and there's a lot of really talented fucking people on there mm -hmm. right now. So I don't know. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm just really, that, really, really into it. Uh, I've, I've had listeners, Justin, because I've, I've spoken to some of my listeners recently about maybe going on Substack. And uh, a couple of them are already on there and they're, they're supporting my show because they like my show. But they're like, please come over to Substack. Um, because they're already over there and they, they prefer it. And like for, for somebody like you that is very productive in terms of doing lots of media all the time, they like it because they can not only get your regular stuff, but it's easy to alert you when other programs are going on. So uh, Justin just appeared on Great Night. Justin just appeared on, uh, yes. uh, you know, what, whatever the thing is. Like it, it's a very good way to follow multiple people that are doing, because like, like I, we all do lots of media outside of our own shows. And, and if you've got, big fans, and I know you've got very big fans, they might want to follow you not just on your show, but your exploits on other shows as well. And Substack's apparently very good for that. Uh, it's night and day. You know, there's there's no equivalent on other platforms from my perspective. Now, all that being said, uh, good, 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 great. Oh my God, you made the best decision ever. I'm terrified. I'm shitting fucking bricks because I took the number one way that I make money, and uh, uh, in case people don't remember, I have, within the last four years, purchased a house, and uh -huh. within the last two months, procreated a child. So, like, there's a lot of big-ticket financial things that are happening, and currently my wife is without a job. So and, I am the your, sole your breadwinner, mistress, and I was able to do that with my, to with, 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 with my Patreon money. Uh, now... I am going to be risking that, hoping that people follow me across the chasm into the world of Substack. Uh, uh, so I'm, I am uh, terrified. I am, I am legit terrified that this was a really, really bad decision. But at the same time, I believe in the future so much that I am going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, and I, I will add to that, Justin, I believe in you. And I, I know that sounds corny, but I've been living in political media. I've been working in political media for over a decade now. And at what you do, you are the best. Um, you know, uh, most most of political media, is, most of it, is red team, uh, yay red team, boo blue team, or yay blue team, uh, boo red team. I'm not in that space. You're not in that space. But I, I'm I'm doing something different in terms of analyzing the actual politics, not not the not the ideology, not the not the policies, but the 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 scrum, the scrum yeah. and the strategy. You're the best at this. And I, and I say that truthfully, that like a lot of what, when I go do other programs, when I get invited on stuff, I am frequently re-microwaving Justin's opinions <laughs> that I have stolen from him and just ran with them. So I think you're going to be okay uh, because uh, you've got a very smart, awesome fan base and you're really good at this. You're very talented. You're very insightful. And I, I think that your, your talent and your industry will carry the day. Uh, well, thank you very much. I do very much appreciate that, and uh, uh, I hope you are right. I assume you're right. I'm not, yeah, you want to know Fuck that. Uh, this uh, 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 looking down at my shoes bullshit. 
Uh, I, I'm going to be fine. It's going to be good. It's very scary now, but it's going to be, it, it is, it is going to be fine. And I, I will say that, um, you know, Substack has been very helpful. If you are on the PX3 Substack, uh, uh, or sorry, on the PX3 Patreon, and you are looking to get over the hump in the email that you got, uh, Substack, just the people that I'm working with were like, Hey, just throw our emails in the actual post. Like, if you have a problem, you're going to email an actual fucking person and the actual fucking person is going to fix your shit. Uh, in Brian, you've been on the internet for a long time. You've Once worked or twice. with a lot of platforms. Uh, how unheard of is that on a scale from one to unheard of that a massive platform is like, hey, let's put our personal work emails out there so your community can be happier. Uh, it's an indication of an early growth platform. And uh, yeah, there there was a time that that's the whole reason that Patreon got on our radar was because in the very, very, very early days of Patreon, there were those people. It's been a minute. Been a minute. Maybe three shows name changes ago <laughs> since, since those <laughs> days were around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't want to I don't want to be the guy who shits on Patreon. The initial yeah, version the of only the place for you to get double the amount of Great Night, including the Lost Bones episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, coming well, back. I mean, like, look, there is there is an initial version of the essays. I wrote two essays, one for Patreon and one for Substack. And the Substack one just went out today. I'm going to tell you this. Initially, they were filled with a lot of my feelings. My <laughs> feelings about a lot of things. Some of them are involved uh, uh, with Patreon and, and decisions that Patreon has made. Uh, they are all out of there because I don't, I, I don't have any ill will to Patreon. Patreon gave me my independent living. I very much love uh, uh, that platform. It was just not going to be for the future of PX3, especially when Substack is there and they care so much about political media. I mean, like in the last six months, They've brought Nate Silver and Taylor Lorenz exclusive to their platform. If if one website did that, they said that we signed Nate Silver, we signed Taylor Lorenz to our platform, that would be a thing that you'd be like, wow, that's fucking crazy. I wonder how much money they're spending. They didn't spend shit. They said, we want to offer you the ability to create your own thing. And they believe in that. Their audiences believe in that. And uh, uh, despite the fact that they don't have a ton in common, except for the fact that they both worked at the New York Times once, uh, that's a commitment to where the heat is. And that's where the political audience is. And now it's where PX3 is. Well, and, and not for nothing, I do think that uh, uh, Patreon is smelling the heat and they're getting nervous. They just announced that this week um, they are the exclusive source for Double the Bones episodes, two Bones <laughs> episodes, this week at patreon.com slash great night. <laughs> when are you going to post the old bones that should have went out Thursday? You mean the the first of two new bones? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> How about three back days a week? back Great. bones. <laughs> we got more bones than a rib cage, baby. We, uh, you want frottage? Well, this is bone on bone action. <laughs> no, no. Frottage like is when you rub I your like dicks. It. Yeah. No, Boner. it's a good time. Do we have a game? Are we going to do a game? Yeah, we do. Uh, uh, we've been crowding out. Uh, this has been a vegetable episode so far, um, uh, which Thank is good. You. They're healthy. I appreciate that. I'm selling vegetables. I appreciate you letting me hawk, hawk my vegetables. <laughs> uh, 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 all right, Nathan, what do you got for us? Hello, hello. Tonight, we come back to steal all of your money as we play Shut Up and Take My Money. But first, we have something very important. Uh-oh. Oh, do we have Jart? Oh, wait, uh, hey, Nathan, no. Nathan, can I tell you something? Yeah. You, when I was last here... Uh, uh, graciously invited on the program by Justin O'Brien, I won a giant pink uh, stuffed animal uh, that I gave to Wallace. He loves it. It is the, It's roughly the size of Wallace, 
Every time I come home and I open the door, Wallace grabs it and drags it through the house, knocking furniture over. He can barely step over it. He loves it. So I want you to know the prize you gave me has had more utility than virtually anything else in my house. I, I, I'm so glad to hear it. I was so delighted when I found that, like, three-foot-tall peep. Mm -hmm. All right. But first, something uh, very important. So Travis Tubbs is a member of the Diamond Club community, and he sent in a package uh, with two items that are very important to uh, Brian and Justin. Uh the first item actually comes from our dear bio cow as the prototype sign. Uh -oh. Oh. 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 Oh, I wish we had a drum roll. The prototype uh, night attack on the Ooh. air sign. This is oh. the original one. He bought it off of okay. bio cow. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, uh, uh, that that needs to go. It, it belongs in a museum, and we've got a museum it right, right a over museum. there. Uh, uh, hey, Heaton, grab that and put it up in the museum. There you go. Uh, uh, that was okay. I had to, our guest do it so that Nathan wouldn't step up and get out of the camera, <laughs> which is exactly what he immediately did. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Our next item uh, comes from doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, y'all's days on. Oh man. I don't see it on here, but it is. <laughs> uh, audio listeners, it's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> yep. Chris, he sent more shit. Hold on. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, a rhenium. Um, do, 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 do. I'm not sure what that is. Wait, what was that? <laughs> Was, was that English? It, it looked like the thing you see at museums yeah, underneath yeah, the painting. Yeah, yeah, to say, <gasps> oh, it's a Ruinum bottle. Uh, Ruinum. Uh, are you familiar more, with, more, with... More museum shit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That looked like an empty wine bottle. Oh, uh, I, I don't think you're, you're hip to the jive on this one. I rarely am. Uh, yeah, dude. Uh, uh, ruin them. We we had our own wine label. Uh, oh, really? Us, us and Adam Carolla had uh, wines at the same time. Nice. Adam Carolla made his wine uh, all about the actual wines that he likes. We said, what if we made a story that this wine was uh, associated with that this profile was associated with the fall of the Roman Empire and everything good, this wine showed up shortly before it all went to shit. <laughs> and yeah, so we essentially it. it was like the, 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 the lore was that as this brew gets popular and it's been popular since Mesopotamia, like it is the, the indicator, if not the conflagration that takes down every empire, every great empire. By the way, this is a great ASMR a uh, podcast. It's just nothing but crinkling paper. <laughs> he sent a lot of uh, shit. Uh, so yeah, so so we had a whole big lore thing to it, uh, but it was a legit sold uh, uh, wine, and we got a lot of. It. I think I still have a couple. In fact, I think I have the original bottle off the press here um, somewhere. Uh, uh, it didn't taste like uh, a good wine. It didn't taste good. It, it uh, was, I'll tell you what, though, it got, it got you hammered. Uh, just ask uh, our friends over at Turquoise G. Faced. All right, oh our last God. item. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Flip flossy. Flip floss for turquoise Jeep. They're like, oh, baby, where's that ruin them? Where's that ruin them? I need that ruin them now. Wow. Damn, I'm fucked up. Africola! <laughs> Jesus. Uh, hold on. You gotta, you gotta find, you gotta find yeah, the that's, ad that's now. A, for that's Africola. a journey that's Is worth African going on. Cola? Uh, okay, first of all, you gotta see. Let's do this. Uh, you guys hit me up with a follow up link on this because I can. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll lean on you guys in chat realm, but I'm going to do a free cola commercial. This is an actual commercial for a competitor for Coca-Cola from the 1960s uh, that, that fascinated us. Uh, it's very odd. Uh, audio listeners, it's exactly what you'd imagine. <clears throat> 1968 with English subtitles. Do you want to read these the subtitles? I'm here for this. The Erde is ein Paradies mit Afrikola. Earth is a paradise, passionate sceneries of Africola, longing feelings, women become feminine and be free, girl power, women's live, male freedom, to marry or not to marry, that's no longer the question, Africola, 
the Augen erzählen der Welt, dass sie Ice telling the world they're in love. Afrikola. Menschen, die bewusst ihre Zeit genießen. Bei vollem Verstand. Fully reasonable. Afrikola. Coffee, tea or Afrik. Think me. That was amazing. That okay. That started out as what I thought was turning into German softcore porn, and yeah. then went nope. Actually, dystopian science fiction. But soda the whole time, consistently, never did it abandon selling Afri Cola. Uh, that is yep. correct. Uh, you nailed it. Our audience so loved it that very quickly uh, this advertisement for a show called NSFW came out, uh, and it looks like this. Heirat oder nicht heirat, das ist nicht mehr die Frage. Die Augen erzählen der Welt, dass sie verliebt sind. Bei vollem Verstand. Coffee, tea or coffee. Trink mich. <lacht> <laughs> Tom Barrett. <Me>. Wow. <laughs> Super. Love. I I would like to congratulate you for disturbing me more <laughs> than the weird ass German thing I saw earlier. By the that way, was by the more way, more disturbing. The, the, even though it was short. The the the, the two women about to kiss each other at the beginning of that one of them is rosanna pancino who's a massive fucking youtuber now what? and uh uh is she's got her whole line of like cookware and shit like that like she's she's fucking massive but she was on the show way back in the day in a totally different context uh uh but yeah no fucking good times uh, and now we have a bottle of Afrikola. When, when is, when is hey! the Afrikola from? Uh, Germany. Well, no, I know where it's from. When is it from? I'm curious. It's like, if you can, you. I believe it's still available. Wonderful. Oh, real. Okay, I was about to say wonderful desk piece, regardless. But I'm wondering if it's like from 1968. and You shouldn't drink it. Well, uh, that is when the ad was created. Okay, but it's still an ongoing product. Okay. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Oh, it says what happened to past tense. Um, the market share dwindled in the 80s and 90s. In 1998, they wrapped it up. Okay, so then we could reasonably infer that bottle is from 98 at the latest? Great. Still good. Still Probably. Good. Still good. They, oh, no, should, they, 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 they changed the, the flavor. That sexy ass ad back on, man. Why just throw it? No notes, dude. Just put it on MSNBC. Start flicking. No, not ours. <laughs> I don't know. I'm fine with that one, too. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, that looked uh, like uh, a game, Saturday Night game. Live. We're yes. playing a game. Let's play a game. We have a game. Uh, once again, huge thank you to Travis Stubbs. He awesome all champion, around. all star. All right, Brian, please head to the first folder to mm -hmm. display the images where y'all will be playing a Price is Right style game. Uh, try and guess how much this is listed for on Craigslist without going over. Each of you have one lifeline to use at your discretion. Uh, okay, so we have here what looks like mannequin heads. Mannequin heads, looking for a mannequin head to practice wigs or lashes, going rate per head. Uh, okay. oh, this is specifically for what did you say yeah. again? Uh, looking for a mannequin head to practice wigs or lashes, a going rate is per head. All right. Oh, so mm. these are just regular I, I, think, old... I think I think they're selling these some bitches at, uh, 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 $8 a head. Is this I, off Craigslist? Uh, uh... This is off Craigslist. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm gonna go with eighteen dollars. Now these these heads are sexy. All like, of if the they races. came to life, they would be they would be like Kim Cattrall. Like like this is this is prime. You don't know whether or not these are gonna come to life, but if they do, boy, they're gonna be real lookers. These so, look like so they're about to drink them. German cola and fuck. <laughs> <laughs> like, they, they got, yeah. Creepy vibes to them. So the the only the only uh, hint that we get is that it seems like they're making some effort to sell us on them, which makes me think that they're gonna try to get like at least twenty bucks. So I'm gonna say twenty bucks. Okay. Mm. So we've got eight, eighteen, and twenty dollars. Yeah. Uh, going rate for these heads from Richmond, Virginia, is fifty dollars, giving Brian the wow, point. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. All Damn. right. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, Yo, right. that's going to be close for you, Eats. You can pick a, a couple heads. Yeah, that's true. I, I can always use some more mannequin heads. Just drive down, drive down to Richmond, man. Throw a couple heads in the back of the fucking uh, yeah, yeah. fuck bus just yeah. for laughs. Absolutely. Or, or if I want to drive in a carpool lane. Easy stuff there now. I don't, I don't know that the dog qualifies, but the, the you, you, mannequin heads might. You, you know the Sharper Image used to sell a full dummy that it claimed was so that women drivers could feel safer when they're on the road ah, with a masculine presence. Smart. Uh, but wink, wink, it was so that you could drive in the HOV lane, but they dare not say it. Yeah. Uh, uh, similar to at the back of Boys Life, Johnson Smith catalog had what they originally sold as um, TV jammers, a hilarious prank, screw up the TV signal. And then the one month, uh, the same ad just said, for testing your radio waves uh, for scientific purposes, uh, so do, to do not use to mess up <laughs> TV signals. So that was a way to get free cable? Uh, no, no, yes, it was a no, way to get, just a way to be an asshole to oh, get the FCC okay. crawling up your butt. Oh, okay, all right. Because I was about to say, like back in the day, in like '98, like my first exposure to pornography was Channel 432. It was just nothing but weird squiggly lines. It took me years to be able to get an erection without weird squiggly lines. So intense <laughs> yeah. was that moment in my sexual awakening. <laughs> All right, Brian, please head on over to folder two. All right, hold on. I'm making notes. Uh, uh, do the bones and also uh, another thing. All right. Uh, wait, how do I? I don't know. Also, how to get some the... squiggly lines. Yeah. Shut up and take my... there, there's. I don't see the. Okay. See some green two. green curtains flipping uh, around. I'm like, there might be a nipple in there. All right. This is a you rare sex. You for hours thinking maybe you saw a nipple. It was a weird time. Well, because also you'd get the audio. Yeah, the, audio the audio came in in full fucking fidelity. Wait, wait, hold on. Uh, do you remember the time that, that they were banned from having the audio? And so they would just play up until 10 p.m. Central. They would just play jazz music and there would be no uh, uh, sex audio. Oh. And then, but then, but, uh, is that why I get an erection when I listen to jazz? <laughs> yes, that, that is exactly it. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I involuntary come when I hear Dave Brubeck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nathan, uh, uh, what are we looking at here? This is a rare sax Fifth Avenue musical snow globe, New York with Twin Towers. This is the title. Oh. This, <laughs> this vintage piece plays New York, New York, as well as A Train When Wound. The train uh, car inside still moves. Uh, this is located in McKinney, Texas. Oh, McKinney. Uh -oh, Brian. <laughs> yeah. I. Oh, no. It was the, uh, uh, the significance was not lost on me. Uh, I'm going to say this that goes... That it's in McKinney? Uh, what's that? That it's in McKinney? No. It's close. We no. could go get it if y we wanted. Yes, actually. What, what were you thinking? Uh, what were you thinking? Uh, what significance uh, were you thinking of specifically? Because I was thinking about it being in McKinney. What were you thinking I'm of? just... Look, I'm not here to say exactly what's interesting about this guy. Yeah, I, I know outside. what it is. I, I'll say what we're all thinking. <laughs> uh, the A-Train uh, sucks. <laughs> Why would you yeah, want to have a snow globe with the A-Train in it? It never gets yeah, there. Yeah, the A-Train's terrible. Take the number yeah. trains. Wait, wait, hold, let's go back to Brian. What were you thinking of? Oh, I just what noticed that, the, that, that in the reflection uh, the windows open in, in the just the bluest skies. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, hey, uh, I think this goes for nine dollars and eleven cents. All right, wow. nine dollars and eleven cents. It took Brian. me a second there, but that was some good numerical pun. <laughs> um. Oh no! All the jokes. I think they're They're pushing it. Hold on, hold on. Let's count the buildings, Justin. <laughs> no, hold on. Wait a minute, Brian. Three, here, I'm going to text you. Look, I'm going to text you five, the joke that I'm not going to say. Six. Okay. All right. He texts me too. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. Uh, All right. Hold on, Eaton. All right. I'm going to text you the joke. You can't say the joke, but you can laugh at the joke if it's funny. Okay. We'll laugh in the appropriate um, uh, accent. Do 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 do
Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, 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 Andrew, what do you think this is going for? I think they're pushing that as a collector's item. <laughs> and so I think it's going to be $80. $80 from Andrew. Uh, yeah, you want to know? I'm going to go... I'm going to go higher than that. I'm going to say uh, 140 oh. No, I'm going to say $99, the same amount that you can get 150 episodes of Politics, Politics, Politics for <laughs> right now at the Politics, Politics, Politics Substack. This offer ends on Halloween. Spooky. <laughs> and ironically enough, you made the best of landings, Justin. And in fact, you did win the Snow Globe valued at $100, so you get a point. Hey! Wow. Well done. And he left a fair margin in there, so we could have we could have sniped it, but yep. All right. I am lowballing this way too hard. I need to I need to set my sights Ah, uh, no, he'll mess with you. I'm just <laughs> enjoying the reflection of this guy's house, whoever this is. Like you can see there's there's his yeah. All right. Please head on over to folder three. Okay, all right, I gotta leave this one. Hold on. There we go. Okay, folder three. What are we looking at? You are looking at a red skeleton 1991 Maestro piece, uh, 18 by, uh, by 22 frame painting signed. This authentic lithograph signed in oil by the artist is housed in its original frame with an engraved br uh, brass plaque from the studio. Artist stamp with authenticity as well as limited edition numbering is on the back. Why the fuck does it have a printed Red Skelton 1991 thing as if it's a print? Uh, it's an original uh, painting? So, so Nathan does this thing where he reads extraordinarily fast. I think he's making a commentary about how slow and old we are. But uh, but but he also pronounced it lithograph, uh, which means that this is a poster. I see. Okay. And, and and that's the entirety of what we can see. They just have that that brass. Oh plate no, no. There's more. There's more. There's okay. there's. I still feel like there's, there's more, more pictures. To see. Uh, yeah. Uh, there we are. Yeah. Okay. This uh, object is located in... Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, I don't have that listed here. Let me just pull that up. It's located on the internet. Uh, located so, in Louisville, Texas. Uh, Red, Red Skelton is even before my time. Like, I've heard of Red Skelton, but I'm not even sure who this is. I feel, uh, I feel like as, it's like a as, radio oh my personality. God, I just realized I'm the oldest person on the panel. Uh, uh, when I was way young... Like on Nickelodeon, they would advertise next to Dorf on Golf. They would uh, they would promise me that this VHS tape of Red Skelton's greatest gags was funny. Um, I remember him sitting at a piano. That's about it. Was he as funny as Mark Russell? Because that's within my time frame. Uh, yeah, I don't know who. I know. Mark Russell was pretty funny. He yeah. would play the piano and sing songs about Congress. So, so I, I think <laughs> I think a clue. Who, oh, that guy. Yeah, uh, that guy. He was great. Yeah. Okay. I got nothing bad to say about Mark Russell. So here, here's the clue. Um, we know this is a lithograph, and then you can see the reflection right here. So that's a pane of glass. Is or it the same plastic. guy's house from the last one? <laughs> no, you can't tell. Hold on. Yeah. Maybe you can. I don't know. How blue are the skies? Uh, <laughs> maestro. Wait, did you call it Maestic? I thought I said Maestro. Oh, okay. Maybe you did. Uh I'm, I'm going to say, uh, oh, actually, who won? Uh, Justin won. You have to go first. Oh, I believe it is $512. $512 has been recorded. Uh, I'll, wow. $1. $1 from Rushwood has been recorded. I'm going to go with $120. $120 from yeah. Keaton. Gentlemen, this piece is worth... $300 giving Heat in the point. Yeah! Wow! Dang. Finally got a point. All right. Hey, Heat hey, is on the board. Hey, oh. We are at our halfway points, which means it's time to introduce tonight's prize. And because this is a Price is Right style game, you can earn a bonus point if you guess how much this cost. Oh, the prize. Oh. Tonight's prize comes from the Austin store End of an Ear, a wonderful vinyl record shop that also happened to have the VHS copy of the 50-year-old Blazing <gasps> Saddles. Oh, now we're playing for, for, for real shit that Justin's losing his goddamn <laughs> mind about. 
Whoa, I walk by whoa. that store all the time too, because that's on when it, whenever I walk from my place to um, Saint Elmo, I always walk by End of an Ear. Yeah, oh, yeah, is it's it, great. Uh, it's it's there uh, at the corner of Lamar and and two ninety, right? Yeah, it's right yeah. at that corner. Yeah, yeah it's, that, it's, that, up, that, it's up on Ben White and Manchac, basically. Yeah, that that used to be we're, straight we're, music company, and before that, it was a movie theater uh, that I saw Legends of the Fall in in uh, nineteen ninety five. No, 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 no. Straight, it's a little too far. Music company. Yeah, that's that's on that's that's uh, that's on the on the Lamar side, not on the Manchac side. Oh shit. Okay. Well, I definitely have seen end of an local ear. lost in geography. Uh, Only three of you will care. <laughs> that's fine by me. We yeah. should Nathan, Nathan. Are we guessing the price of that cassette? Uh, you may guess the price of this cassette for an extra bonus point. Uh, right. Uh, you know what? Actually, no. It's a billion dollars, and that's going to be the gospel truth until we say otherwise. Uh, but meanwhile, we're competing over this lovely gem. Uh, at number four is 600-plus beer-slash-seltzer cans in the original cases. This does not contain any alcohol. This is just the cans. Uh, this hall contains 29 cases of empty beer cans, one uh, case of hard cider, and this collection is meant for either the bulk collector or individual reseller on eBay. This comes from Richmond, Virginia as well. Mm. Who the fuck <laughs> is drinking the Hey, Cindy, wait, hold on. Don't throw away that rolling rock. Put it back in the box with all of the other rolling rocks as we drink them in consecutive order. And by the way, do me a favor. Yingling, don't throw it away. Put it all, even though it's very easy to get Yingling and rolling rock, don't throw it away. Put it in the box because other psychos like me might go online and want empty cans of nondescript, easily obtainable beer for unknown purposes. You know, this is like one of those things, Heaton, like remember when they tried to privatize social security back in the Bush era? Yeah, and they yeah, were like, yeah. look, this is gonna sound weird, <laughs> but if we put the money in the safest possible, there's no way it can go wrong, uh, 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 stock market accounts, we're just gonna have more to pay out over time. This is like that where it's like, hey, Instead of throwing these cans, these useless pieces of trash away, or if you're really into it, uh, uh, going to the recycling place and maybe getting a deposit back. Instead, let me pitch this to you. Weird nerds. <laughs> there are weird nerds that will pay for this shit if only you take the time to wash out the can and throw it in the original box. For Is it for fetish? We don't know. Maybe. But, like, who cares when you're going to make $2 a can? Nathan, can you check and see if Dick Cheney is the seller of this particular mm. beer? Because that would explain a lot. All right. Uh, 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 what? Uh, oh, look. They got they got even more over here, too. There's um, a lot here. They, they got I've been a, washing how, all how, of how my many, cans how many, for 30 years. How many is it again? 600 listed cans plus 100 extra ones that are not in the picture. Oh, wait, hold on. I got, I got an alternate theory to Justin's. I think this is a very clever, forward-thinking alcoholic. So they're like, God damn it, you drank a whole case before noon? You're an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic. I am saving all of this for eBay. <laughs> it's, there's, there's, I'm, I'm doing this for you, honey. Uh, all right. I, I like to believe that it's like it's very Skinner in the steamed hams uh, yeah. a sketch, just like a stammering, like, no, I haven't skipped work to drink this entire rolling <laughs> rock. I'm selling it on eBay. Uh, you know what? I'm going to surprise you guys. I'm going to say uh, $250. Actually, maybe $500. I'll go $500. Wait, but how many? How many? Wait, 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 what's the Hall here. There's 600 cans, and I have five words for you. Period, piece, movie, set, design. Ooh, okay. Right. I don't agree with that, but nice. Nobody asked you what you agree with. You're not even <laughs> playing the fucking game. <laughs> I'm repping. <laughs> I think that uh, Brian is insane, and we're about to automate all of that shit as well as Hollywood, and good for it. So I'm going to go with $20. No, $30. $30 for the amount of cans. $30 is what I'm going to go with. Yeah, I'm going to undercut it. I'm going to say it's $25 for all these cans. I don't get the bargain. I have no idea what the market is. But holy shit, 
if this is real, I'm never throwing a can away again. I hate recycling. I genuinely do. I think it's fucking bullshit. I think I think the fact that we've put this religious stigma to save our earth by way of us doing the ridiculous sacrament of sorting our trash. Oh, the world. Milton's a category five in the fucking Gulf of Mexico. Well, maybe if you put your trash in the right bins, it we, we wouldn't have this death. Ridiculous. That being said, I will meticulously sort every fucking can I ever drink if there's actual money in this. I think you're right, by the way. I, th I think recycling ends up being a net negative because there's a bunch of people that think they've done their part by sorting their garbage and they're done. They're like, yeah, that's oh, it. Oh, I'm an environmentalist. I sorted my garbage. It, it doesn't affect carbon. Like it, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, man, uh, wait, is it just me or are hurricanes getting bigger these days? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'm from Oklahoma, so I kind of uh, I'm, I'm, I'm only looking at tornadoes and earthquakes. The earthquakes are getting bigger. I mean, they are they are number six on the last day, people. N n number uh, 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 give a College number. Football joke. No one's gonna get it. Move on. Just fucking move on. Oh wait, you guys did give a number. Twenty five. For the low 30. low price of one hundred dollars, giving Heaton the point, you can own six hundred plus cans of beer. All right, Heaton's making a comeback. A hundred bucks for six hundred cans. A hundred dollars. Has it sold? This is still actively listed. Every one of these is still actively listed. Se Nathan, text me that. I, I feel like I need to get in contact with this person. I need to know whether or not they have ever done this before. I, I There's a story here. Yeah, is this some kind of weird money laundering thing? Because if so, it's not enough. Uh, the link is in chat. Uh, I will text it to you after show. All right. Text it to me, please. Yes. All right. Uh, next on our list is a 1924 Ford Street Rod truck. Absolutely no trades. Um, it is kitted out to absolute heck and back with an eight-cylinder beauty and still has the original cowl and drives like a dream. Hmm. How much is this listed for? Hmm. Uh, this is also in Waco, Texas. Oh, oh. just up the road. Wow. Wow, Dude, this Brian, is... could you imagine waiting in traffic and Waco in this motherfucker? <laughs> in the dead of summer? <laughs> Fortunately, Waco it's... traffic goes slow enough in my experience that you would not you, you wouldn't be throwing anybody off with it. It's got a clear chassis. Look at that. Uh, the pipes come out of the chassis so you can watch the engine go. I gotta say, this looks like a great vehicle for me and Wallace to tool around in. Like, oh that, my that has god, you guys would be fabulous. Very strong heating vibes in it. Like, <laughs> give Wallace a little aviator scarf. Have him sit in the side seat with me. This is what I would imagine you would 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 uh, 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 burst out of the sky like Doc Brown at the end of <laughs> Back to the Future Three. In. I just realized that the plexiglass is an optical illusion. This is just the front and uh, the bottom of the building uh, looks like it's glass on there. That's crazy. Um, uh, yeah. All right. So I think this is. Hmm. Hmm. $12,000. $12,000 has been recorded. Eaton? I think $18,000. $18,000 yeah. has been recorded. I'm going to say $20,000. $20,000. $20, you too can own a 1924 Ford Street Rod truck for $15,000, giving Justin the point. Nice. Oh! Nice. Hey! Well done. Hey! I'll tell you what. Sometimes really impressive things just need to get the fuck out of your house. Uh, uh, we all know somebody who I will not name. That literally sold a boat for one dollar. <laughs> oh my god! Week. Wait, this isn't who I'm thinking, is it? Uh, you okay. know what? I don't uh, know how many boat friends you have. <laughs> Surprisingly, I only have one friend. boat friend. A dollar? Yeah, what? Because that shit needed to get the fuck out of his garage. <laughs> Wow, I would have bought it for a dollar. It costs no, you, money to You're fucking just, moving. You yeah. don't have well, you don't Could I put it on a tow truck and just you, live in it? Is it a houseboat? You, you got to put cool? a trailer on your trailer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what I would do is I'd, I'd take my existing trailer and I'd weld it to the boat. And, and, then I, and then I would just, I would put both on a flatbed and live in that. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. <laughs> It'd be pretty cool. I, you should have contacted yeah. me. I would have bought it. You would get it. Yeah, you get a mule to pull it. Or you could go, hey, uh, no, truly though truly remember brian the very first time i came to this property the hmm. very first time i came here you were hanging out with macaulay colkin you remember this yeah and oh, we, yeah. we we did a tour of the grounds 
and and you showed a uh, a a basin that will fill up with water, mm -hmm. and like I have been pushing for you to buy a sub a decommissioned submarine or boat and just leave it there. Uh, you you even sent I could have done links. that for a dollar. This would have been amazing. I would have just parked my boat in your property, and then <laughs> whenever I whenever I stay here, I would stay in the boat. Uh, it, it also would incentivize me hurrying up and make that pond. It's like, uh, hey, man, you want to move your submarine? It's like, look, dude, you won't see it at all if you just fill this place with fucking water. It's going to be an undersea restaurant, a little cafe. See, th this is my problem with, with most of the people I know that have, like, real disposable income is they're not eccentric enough. I'm eccentric as fuck, and I don't have that much disposable income. Like, yeah. I was literally at a castle in what, northern England I mean a month ago, and I, I saw this— Big ass reflecting pool, and my first words were, "You should get a jet ski because that would be fucking awesome." That right? would be awesome. If you had a moat, you should get a jet ski. I like. I should be an advisor for eccentric. For, not for. I should be the eccentric advisor for people with interesting disposable. You should incomes. be like like what Hitch was to men who couldn't find a mate. You should be that for rich people who aren't eccentric. Yeah. Enough. Be like, oh, what, like, what do you want? Oh, you were gonna go to a club for forty thousand dollars? Fuck that! We're gonna get yeah. five different hot air balloons. We're gonna play ping pong in the air and drop silver dollars on people. It'll cost just as much. It'll be a better story. I'd be good at that. You, you should. Yeah, no, you, you, Once you should be the Mary Poppins really for done, a fucking I was, disaffected rich person. I mean, I was about to say you're about to get closer to being rich when everybody goes to Amazon.com and make sure to buy yeah. tribalism is dumb. That's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have yeah. hot air balloon money by the end of that one. Okay. Uh, All right, head on to directory six. Uh, wait, I, I, you said okay. Uh, <laughs> we were at number two. You said we were halfway. Uh, All right. Uh, oh, wait. No, I guess we were at three. Never mind. I'm wrong. And you're right. There we go. And got it. What is this? Concrete lawn statues kissing Dutch couple. These are vintage Dutch uh, couple statues that have been restored with a new coat of paint. They each weigh a collective uh, 100 pounds. Their names are Jesus. Hans and Freshna. Okay. Immediately, <laughs> immediately I see an opportunity. If you just... Wait, go back, Nathan. Go back to the first photo. If you just turn the gal around, yep, that's so what that I was they're, thinking. They're butt fucking. It'd be real funny yep. to put in a yard. Like, I, there's a real missed Burst opportunity here for up. doggy style Dutch ceramics in the yard. Fuck you, HOA. God, if he was balls deep in that, uh, that would look pretty good. Which again, just more evidence that I should be adopted by a rich person because that was right out the gate. Dude, mm. talk about a finger in the dike. <laughs> 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 like look at like okay so or so better yet if you get two or three of just that guy and centipede them together in the yard and uh, have the gal watching them uh, dude and by the way those are heavy oh my those God. are 50 bucks a piece they're both or, presenting. 50 pounds a piece um i'm gonna say whoever painted this number one they did uh uh a fairly wait look at the goose <laughs> wait go back go back the goose is watching <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the goose is looking at her butt <laughs> uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to say whoever did this probably put enough effort into it that they want like 50 bucks each. I'm going to say $99. $99. $99 has been recorded. They're heavy, you know. But that also might mean that like they got gifted that shit and they just need to get it the fuck out of there, which means I'm going to go lower. I'm going to say that you can have these Dutch twerking fucking <laughs> twins for the low price of $49. Dutch twerking sounds like a thing that would wind you up in the hospital with a broken cock. Like it like Dutch twerking yeah. sounds like like oh he was he was Dutch twerking. Like really was Dude, he doing can you yoga imagine the twerk cuz you don't want to do a Dutch the twerk. Dutch, uh, all they do is ride bicycles. Those thighs are fucking pistons. Yeah, they've got golden perineums, just <laughs> sterling silver they, perineums. The problem is they have no ass. If you ever had a Dutch person with a big fat fucking honker of an ass, like it might actually like be the most famous person in the world with the way that they could pop it. Yeah, good point. I'm gonna go 120. I'm gonna highball this. I've been lowballing too much stuff. I'm going 120 on this uh, for the Dutch sex statues. Mm. Mm. Or. Two hundred dollars in Muskegon, Michigan. Heaton, you can own these kissing Dutch statues. Uh -huh. wait, 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 what did you go for, Justin? 
Oh, I went for thirty bucks. I I, I fucked up. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, all right. So wait, so 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 uh, who won the game? Hold on, hold on. We are at the final round. Trust me, there's a final round for a reason. The points are currently at Heaton three, Justin two, Brian at one. Remember, boys, you are competing for the actual VHS copy of the fiftieth anniversary for Blazing Saddles. So to stir this up, this point, this round is worth three points. Please head to directory seven. All right. This Mini Jeep 125cc is located in Wiley, Texas. The skeletons are not included. It is not. <laughs> it runs just fine. All you need to do is break, uh, bleed the brakes. Good luck. Uh, wait, so the, it runs fine, but the brakes don't work. You need to bleed them. It's fine. It's shout, fine. <laughs> shout out to the marketing genius who's like, you know, people you gotta really put... need to see what they look like in the Jeep. And I like to have a little fun. It so actually, I'm going to put a it, couple of skeletons there. It is legit brilliant. It, yeah. it, it makes it really stand out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you said this is a Willie? Uh, Wiley, Texas. Uh, oh, Wiley, Texas. Okay. Uh, what kind of Jeep is it? Uh, mini it Jeep. is a mini Jeep rated for 125cc. Oh. So wait, so that's not a Power Wheels then? Like this is like an actual thing? Yeah. I'm going to go with $500. Not including this the is like This is like a Shriner car? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's like a go-kart. Uh, it's, okay. it's not actually Jeep branded though, right? I mean. I'll bet you you could, I'll bet you you could outrun a really, really small Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> God, I'm such a nerd. I'm like, that was a Ford Explorer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, man, I'm going to go $2,000. 2K, 2K. All right, 2K has been recorded. Uh, who, who's um, not gone? I will say that is a $125 mini Jeep. 125 has been recorded. Heaton? I'm going 500. $500 from Heaton. Wow. That's a good spread. To own this mini Jeep, rated for 125 cc, 1,300 giving Heaton the point and winning the game. Oh, yeah. Oh. I'm going to drink that. Afri Cola or whatever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Nice. And I am finally the owner of Blazing Saddles. This looks too large to be a VHS tape. Yeah, open it up. It's got a case oh. with it. It's got a little recessed thing in there. All right. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Wow. Dude, that was back when it was a prestige thing to own a VHS tape. Like, right. like you wanted something to go up on your mantle. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Wow, nice. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hey, Heaton, you got anything to plug? Well, actually, Brian, I have a book that just came out. It's called Tribalism is Dumb. You can find it on Amazon.com. You can get it in Audible form or Kindle form or paperback form. Uh, so what about you, Justin? Any calls to action? Yeah, head on over to uh, Politics, so Politics, Politics on Substack. We're not on Patreon anymore. So Please, if you are on Patreon, sign up on Substack. We got great fucking shows coming up. I swear to God, go or I'll cry. My child depends on your largest pie. And, of course, uh, go to Patreon.com slash Great Night to get two bonus episodes this week. Boner Palooza! We'll see you next Tuesday! <laughs> Die in a fire. I'm allergic to bees. <laughs> Hard cut, fast fade. Bye, guys. <laughs>